I am a very happy failure. <laughs> Forty years ago, I took off to the Amazon to convert a tribe of Indians called the Pitaha to Christianity. I was going to translate the Bible for them. I was going to uh, tell them about they, the fact that they don't need to fear death, that they're going to go to heaven after they die, and, and contribute my life in exchange for their happiness. That was my goal. So we boarded up this small Cessna single-engine aircraft in December of 1977, and I was going to go see these people for the first time. I had some anxiety. I was excited. I didn't know what I was going to find. And we took off, and two hours later, we landed on this small jungle strip in the middle of the Amazon. And the first thing that I realized was I was very airsick. Um, and with, we opened the plane doors, and we were surrounded by dozens of pitahas uh, talking to us in a language that I couldn't make out a single syllable, uh, asking me questions, pulling on me, and I picked up a stick off the ground, and I said, uh, this is a stick. And they said, eh, and I dropped it, and they said, eh, he make it kalbe, and I was on my way to learning the language. Uh, as, they, as they started to show me around the village, one man pulled me by the arm, and he, uh, he showed me a, a large rat, uh, a 15-pound rodent, actually, called a paca, roasting on a fire. I could smell the hair. Blood was still coming out of the mouth. And it sort of turned my stomach. This got me outside of my comfort zone very quickly. I, my idea of a good meal is uh, white bread and chicken gravy. And uh, uh, eating a rat wasn't, wasn't there. In fact, later that day, when I was putting mustard that I had brought from the city on a bologna sandwich, you can see I was adapting very slowly, um, <clears throat> a woman came up behind me and she said, uh, look, Dan's eating bird shit. And uh, I looked at the mustard and listened to the sound and I could see where she got that uh, impression. But when I turned to talk to her, her uh, hand was full of a roasted rat head and she was sucking the brains out. So she was grossed out by my food, and I wasn't terribly pleased by what she was eating. <laughs> what I have found over the years is that information is hard to come by. New information is hard to come by. When we surround ourselves by people who look like us, and talk like us, and eat like us, and think like us, there's very little room for additional learning. But when I was surrounded by the Pinaha, every single syllable I heard every day long was new information to me. It was a chance to learn. The language turned out to be one of the most unusual languages uh, anyone has ever studied. It was my privilege to go there. Uh, I, I asked the word for skin, and I got awe. And I asked the word for ear, and I got awe. And I asked the word for hand, and I got awe. And I asked the word for Brazil nutshell, and I got awe. And then I asked the word for me, and I got che. And I asked the word for dog excrement, and I got che. <laughs> I asked the word for uh, enemy, eventually, and they said, magiai. And so I said, how do I say friend? Magiai. <clears throat> the tones are vital to every vowel in the language. If you don't have the right tone, there's only two, high and low, you don't get the language. And because it has tones, it can be whistled, it can be hummed. Whenever they wanted to lose me, they just started whistling and I couldn't follow what they were saying. I also learned that the language has a syntax, a grammar that's very different from any other grammar that's been studied. Um, so, for example, I can say in English, uh, you drink, you paddle your canoe, you may drown. Uh, but in Pitaha, you can only say, you drink, you paddle your canoe, you may drown. That sounds like a subtle difference, but it's caused all sorts of controversy in cognitive science to say that the people choose to talk like that. And then I started working on numbers, and I thought the number one was the word hue, and I thought the number two was the word hue, and I thought the word for many was bagisu. But it turns out that hue just means a few, hue means a few more, and bagisu means piling stuff on top of each other, a lot of stuff. A people without numbers, not even the number one, this was greeted with tremendous skepticism. A scientist came from Columbia University, Stanford, from MIT, and they did all sorts of experiments to try to prove me wrong. Uh, but in fact, that's the way the Pitaha are. And it, the first language ever documented without numbers was found. It showed us a different uh, way of thinking. 
It showed us uh, how extensive the perimeters of the human experience are and how many lessons there are to learn from people very unlike ourselves. Uh, the words for color. You know, my hair used to be red, and they, they told me that it was Ibeisai. So I put that down as red, and then I found something that was black, and they said Kopayai, and something that was white, and they said Kobiai. But then I noticed they changed the words very frequently. And finally, I realized these aren't even words. These are descriptions. They might say my skin is transparent, or you can see through it, or they might say that my hair looks like blood, or they might say that the river color of the river is uh, the color of not being ripe. Uh, they use different ways to describe different things. And I started to link these things to a single principle, which I call the immediacy of experience principle, which is not that they can't think about the past or they can't think about the future, but they prefer not to talk about things in the distant future and the distant past for which there is no uh, evidence. So for example, one day I said, so who created the world? This is a good missionary question. And they said, uh, <clears throat> what do you mean? I said, you know, there were no trees. Somebody made the trees. You were there when there were no trees? <laughs> You've seen the jungle without trees? How old are you? And <clears throat> so it turns out they don't believe anything was ever created. They don't have a concept of God. There's no need for him in their, in their system. And as a missionary, I was talking to them a lot about Jesus. So one day, a group of men came in, and they said, hey, Dan, so Jesus... Um, did he look more like us or did he look more like you? I said, well, you know, some people said he looked more like me and other people said he looked more like you. Yeah, but you've seen him. So what does he look like? I said, well, actually, I've never seen him, but your father saw him. No, my dad never saw him either. Well, who saw him? I said, nobody. He's lived a long time ago. Well, if he lived a long time ago and nobody saw him, why are you telling us about him? <laughs> <clears throat> and it occurred to me, that all the evidence that I had accumulated in Bible school and, and, and all my prayers and, and all my activity as a Christian didn't hold up to the evidentiary requirements of this group of a few hundred, hundred hunter-gatherers in the Amazon. They weren't, they weren't convinced by this at all. So finally one day they came in and they said, Hey, Dan, you know, we like you, but we don't want any Jesus. We don't want to know about this stuff. You know, it's okay for Americans. They like to believe that stuff, but uh, Peter Hunt don't believe that stuff. And so I had to focus on other things. And what I had gone there to do was to tell them about no fear of death. But then it turns out they're not afraid of death. <laughs> death is just a natural part of life. So I wanted to help them learn how to be happy. But when I took researchers from MIT there, they said, these must be the happiest people on earth. <laughs> and I said, well, how would, you, how would you study that? And they said, well, we just measure the time they spend smiling and laughing. I bet it's more than anybody else. Uh, so I had no happiness to offer them. I had no fear of death, so I tried to talk to them about uh, a judgment and, and how to live. And this, the most important commandment among the Pitahas, don't tell anybody else what to do. Everybody does. Life's hard enough. Just live your life the best you can. Uh, so that didn't work either. And eventually I came to the realization, if it doesn't work for them, it probably shouldn't be working for me. And I became an atheist. So the only con convert I ever got... <laughs> My only convert was me. Uh, so, so I'm a failure. There are no Peter Ha believers. There's no church. Uh, they don't, uh, none of that stuff worked. But I, I learned a lot about language, so I decided I, maybe there was some useful profession I could enter. So I became a linguist and an anthropologist and, and began under, trying to understand their culture in, in even greater detail. And realizing that new information is, again, as I've said, hard to come by. If you sit in a room with people who look just like you, who are your gender, who are your age, your economic background, the chances of getting really new information are minimal because everybody already agrees. It's like a famous philosopher friend of mine said once, I don't read anything because if they disagree with me, they're wrong, and if they agree with me, I already knew that. Uh, <clears throat> often that's, that's the way we think until somebody forces us to think differently. So, how can we possibly bring newness to our life? How can we, without going to the Amazon, transform our experience and our relationship to the world in such a way that we open channels of new information? Many computer scientists define learning as change behavior after exposure to new information. So where do we get this new information? Well, one suggestion is 
uh, especially in a place like Philadelphia, look around you and find people different from yourselves. Make friends of different genders, of different sexual orientations, but especially make friends with families. And one thing I suggest to people, you don't have to travel outside the United States. Find a family that's willing to tolerate you for a week and go live with them for a week and live under their rules and taste their food and more than taste their food, learn to like it. And if they're from a different religion, learn to respect how they believe and understand how they believe. So you're not just a tourist in their home. You're actually living uh, in their home by their rules. I had to do this for the very first time with the Celtal Indians of southern Mexico. My family, we went to live with the Celtals. Uh, we spent uh, uh, several nights with them. We had sleeping on the dirt floors. We had rats running around. We had all sorts of experiences we hadn't imagined. But at the end of the time, uh, we learned to respect uh, them and their beliefs. They learned a little bit more about us. Of course, the food wasn't a problem with the Celtals because they're descendants of the Mayas and they eat tortillas, black beans, and chilies. And that is, the f that is my favorite food in the world. So that wasn't, that wasn't terribly a, a challenge. Um, but then when we look around us and think about uh, uh, corporate corporations and governance and, and how we can bring this kind of newness into our lives, um, Take a, take a look at the typical boardroom, or, or, uh, and if everyone around that board table looks the same, you can bet that this is not going to be an innovative company. If you look at uh, college admissions, if most of the people coming in are young white males, there's not going to be a lot of innovation there. Diversity is essential to ensure for every one of us new information, a constant flow, and a constant challenge. We don't it's, it's too often we all feel like missionaries. We want to go out and change the world, when in fact we have to begin as students, and not only begin as students, but spend the most of our life with students. I find that the smartest people I know are among the best listeners, the people who cultivate relations with people unlike themselves. So the Pita Hot changed my life. I'm a failure as a missionary, I'm a mediocre scientist, but I have learned a tremendous amount through the world of, through the eyes of the Pinaha, who call themselves Hiaichehe, the straight ones. And we are all Awe, which means crooked. <laughs> so they're ethnocentric. Thank you very much. <laughs>